have a really good think, because somebody you know could earn you a lot of money for very little effort. Think, who do you know that wants to buy a property in Spain? A colleague, a mate, someone in your family, a friend of a friend? If you know someone, go to welcome-estates.com and click the Refer a Friend link. If they buy, you'll pocket a nice chunky thank you from one of Spain's leading estate agents. T's and C's apply. All details at welcome-estates.com. When I fought Hatton, I knocked Hatton out with 10 ounce gloves on. Stepping back when he was undefeated. In yeah, my prime, I spanked him. Yeah, How did he gonna be as yeah, equally talented as me? Are you serious? As easy as I beat him? I could have beat him while playing chuckles on the other side. That's how easy that was. <laughs> and he better than us? Are you serious, James Tony? When I fought Hatton, I knocked Hatton out with 10 ounce gloves on. Stepping back when he was undefeated. See in my eyes that this is gonna be our toughest fight. Your eyes, you know. Over your eyes is messed up. How am I seeing your eyes? And well, you see know. Come on, let's be serious. Let's be serious. You know. On, you know. Let's I don't be serious. Know. You know. Well, well, you don't know. You will. Uh, Kelbrook against Crawford is it's not it's not a fight, is it really? I mean, um, Crawford is one of the pound for pound top fighters in the world right now, and um, Kelbrook is not. Hey, and welcome back to the number one podcast in the sport where it would seem Conor Benz had his road to Damascus moment, finally. So I think most of you know what the road to Damascus means, but essentially the story was, I can't remember where it was in the Bible, it's like Acts, is it Acts chapter 9, verse 2 or 3, can't even remember, but if, if I am right, then that's testament to a good education. But essentially, Saul of Tarsus is sent to to basically destroy Christianity, or at least to hurt some Christians. And on his way to hurt these Christians, he, he has a change of heart, and in fact then converts to Christianity and becomes Paul the Apostle. And I think we're seeing that with Conor Ben. So if you go back to the Piers Morgan interview, <laughs> and we, we did an episode entirely on that Piers Morgan interview, if you go back to that, he was adamant that he was going to do everything on his terms, his way. He didn't need the board. He didn't need the United Kingdom. Never had to fight here again. There were loads of opportunities for him. Fast forward a few weeks, and he's now in the United States. I think he's in California. I think he's with Tony Sims and John Ryder who are preparing out there. And the energy is completely different. The noise is completely different. Now he's talking about the UK being his home, and if his next fight was in the UK, he would absolutely love that. Um, to quote Tupac... He's gathering attention for dialogue. And that's not a bad thing, by the way. It's not. But it it has to come with an acknowledgement that he messed up. And I found it really, really interesting that he was he was so sure that he could do the same thing everyone else had done prior to him in terms of doping offenses, that he could bully UCAD and he could bully the board by sheer force of legal firepower, sheer force of will, trying to own the media space. He thought he could do all of this. And I don't think he understood that the world had changed a lot. Which is a good segue for me to celebrate the third anniversary of the episode I did with, with Larry O. Um, so that was the Beautiful Boxing Podcast. I think it's episode 77, where we, we talked about drugs in boxing. And... Three years later, I love where we are. So I always go back to when I started with the New Age and I'd I'd talk about this. And the feedback on Twitter, the feedback in person was, mate, why did you talk about drugs and boxing so much? It can't be that big a problem. And sometimes people go, here he goes again with his drugs and boxing thing. Then I said at that time, and I was confident, I said, one day you're going to realize how bad it is. And you'll all be like, "Hmm, this guy was right all along. Actually, on a side note, man, let me voice note Martin and Andy because we haven't had like a like a check-in episode and I get asked this all the time. When are you going to do a New Age reunion or when are we going to hear you guys together? So let me just voice note these guys real quick, man. Martin, Andy, do we need to do a check-in episode? Um, you know, I, I'm sure we're funny enough for the fans to still care and boxing's enough of a mess that we can poke fun at stuff.
yeah voice note dropped there i'll try again yeah so let's let's try and do like a, a reunion episode it'll be a good warm-up for for when we all catch up properly yeah you're going to hear this on your phones you're going to hear this in your podcast man sorry guys i just had to do it before i forgot yeah so hopefully you get one done I'm um, just three hours of us being meatheads, I guess. But, you know, back in those new age days, I genuinely thought I was just pissing in the wind. Um, I was like, wow, they're never going to get it. And I used to get laughed at by people in boxing who were like, boxing's, cl- boxing's clean, da, da, da. the problem is elsewhere. And so when I did the episode with Larry, I wanted to bring all of the, the thinking up until that point a lot of the the doping stories up until that point, and then start talking about the ins and outs of it. And the aim of that episode, and the reason the episode was so long, it was well over two hours, maybe three. The reason that episode was so long was we wanted to leave boxing fans in a position where they understood most of their favorite fighters had failed tests, whether they remembered, whether they knew, almost irrelevant. Most of their favorite fighters had failed tests, and a lot of their favorite fighters have admitted to using drugs during their career post-retirement. And so we had, we had a fantastic episode. Um, I still think it's the greatest episode I've done on my own. I think it, it moved the sport. And I, I measure that based on how many times I bump into people who go, mate, what, listen to that episode two or three times. I didn't even know all that stuff was happening. So I'm genuinely, genuinely humbled that people engage with it so much. It might still be my best performing episode ever. It's either the first Larry one or the second Larry one. It's between those two. And they've outperformed Joshua episodes. They outperformed the the Joshua Meltdown episode as well. And the aim was always to give, and I've always said this, better informed boxing fans. We wanted boxing fans to understand how this game works. You know, how how people dope. How they try and get away with it. How they try and stop the fans from knowing that they failed. And so what I think that did, and it wasn't just us, but I think that was the the catalyst for people to have a more honest conversation about drugs. But go back three years, people still didn't want to believe it. I remember, and this is why I can never really be a Liam Smith fan. I remember Liam Smith trying to rip into Larry and trying to discredit what Larry was saying because Larry had failed a drugs test. And I was almost like, well... Who do you expect to talk about this? Do you expect the guys taking drugs and getting away with it to go, hey guys, yeah, I've been getting away with this for ages, but I just thought I'd tell you that, yeah, they're all at it. That's not going to happen. So it has to be guys like Larry that come out. It has to be guys like, you know, Dr. Uz that come out and talk and tell us where the bodies are. That's just the harsh reality of it. You know, we find out about crimes from the people who get caught. That's always that's always been how it's, how it is. That's okay, and and so I look at that and I smile now and I go, "You guys are better informed, and what you've been able to do is just own it, have your own interpretation, have your own opinions, your own views on it." Some people don't mind, and that's okay. But they're informed enough to go based on what I know and I understand how the game works. If they're all at it, cool. May the best doper win. There's some people like that, and there's some people who say, nah, I can't get behind this. And everyone is entitled to hold their view. So I've been happy. Like I look back three years and I go, the steps we've made, and the reason it's relevant to Conor Ben is, I think if this happens three years ago, I think if this happens maybe December 2019, I think Conor Ben's back fighting now. I think the world has moved so far towards cynicism around doping in boxing because boxers were always on their high horse about how special their sport was. And all of a sudden, it caught up with them. And now there's a period of reflection and there's a period of introspection where you have to now look at yourselves and go, how have I been so blind to this when it's been in front of me all this time? And so this brings me back to Conor Ben and his his intent to gather attention for dialogue. Eh, This will be an incredible fall from whatever perch he thought he was on. This is going to be incredible because you have to remember, step one, 
they said to the board, you don't recognise Vardy, therefore stay out of it. That's what that remember, that's what Robert Smith told us the, the letter said. And if you remember, that's what Conor Ben said. The board don't recognise Vardy, so why is this an issue? And as I've said on a few episodes, what he failed to understand was UCAT don't answer to the board. So UCAT have their own criteria, and their, their criteria is essentially what they call risk-based and intelligence-led. So they will look at areas where they think the high risk, risk of doping will exist, and then they will target people based on intelligence. In Connor's case, it was, you know, he, you got UCAT and Vida tested for a big fight. And so, quite rightly, UCAT said, if this is a big fight, we need to be involved. Now, UCAT aren't just limited to their testing. It's any, anything in the public domain that they have access to that would indicate doping, they have to investigate. And that's what they did. They did their job. And Connor was badly advised because had he been correctly advised, what he would have understood from the start was, mate, you failed this VADA test. UCAT have the right to investigate it. You may as well cop the ban now. Yeah, we will come up with a prescription for fertility, whatever, and we'll just take the six-month ban. But he was prideful, and he didn't understand that the damage to his reputation was done already. If you look at Conor Ben now, every Conor Ben post has something about him being a drug cheat. You can't clean up his reputation on social media. Until he holds his hands up, until he takes a ban that the fans feel is appropriate... You can't, you can't turn this tide. And so here we are. He's in California now. He's realized you can't go to the Middle East and say, I'm a drugs cheat. Please give me a, a bucket load of cash to box. Because they're like, well, you're a drugs cheat. Like, that's not good for our country. We have boxing here. So it's a good news story for our people. And it's a good news story internationally. If Conor Ben goes to Abu Dhabi, if he goes to Dubai, if he goes to Oman, if he goes to wherever, he could even go to Yemen. And people will say, that's a drugs cheat. Um, this isn't a good look. You're not going to see him as, a, as an all-conquering hero. And he knows that. I don't think he's going to get much joy in the United States either. Otherwise, the fights would have been announced. They told us Conor Ben would fight in June. That's a month to go. I don't think he is. I don't think realistically he will fight anytime, anytime soon. Because there's no international market for him. Like Unless you put him on an undercard, he's not going to move numbers himself. So that leaves the UK as the only viable option for him. And he knows what he has to do for that. So at some point, there'll be a negotiated solution where there'll be a ban that's backdated for a certain period of time. He might have to serve a ban going forward, but that would be quite short, and that would just be to to show the public he's he's contrite and he's humbled. And then after that, we'll all move on. And I think that's the right thing to do. Hold your hands up, take your ban, and we'll move on. You'll always be known as a drugs cheat because that's essentially what you are, but we'll allow you to box again. But this is definitely a victory for for boxing Twitter because I think if boxing Twitter hadn't been so strongly against Ben skirting the system, he would have been allowed to skirt the system. And then that brings us back to the episode with Larry. Just better informed boxing fans make better decisions. It's as simple as that. Um, so, you know, how do I see the future going? If I were to do an episode with Larry in five years' time, I think we'll be at that point where there'll be performance-enhancing substances that we won't be able to detect. I think you're going to get to a point where you're going to have fast-acting compounds that you inject. So I can get the drug testers in 7 a.m. on a Monday. Once they leave, I can inject whatever I inject in me. It will do everything it needs to do in the space of 12 to 18 hours. I go to bed, I wake up, it's out. Do the same again and the same again so that when the testers come, there's nothing for them to test. There's nothing for them to catch me on. That's where I see the future going. I think the future, as, as we get better with computational approaches and tactics and computing power goes through the roof, I genuinely think we're going to build compounds that are far more effective, far more specific, and almost impossible to detect. That's where I see the future going in all of this. And God help us. But we might get to a societal point where we just accept 
people take drugs. Because if you go back to 2020, TikTok wasn't what it is now. So I remember when the lockdown started, TikTok was, a, was an app. But if you jumped on TikTok, you got loads of stuff from India, Africa, the Far East, South America. It wasn't a, an Anglo-centric or Eurocentric app. We had Instagram for that. We thought Instagram was the be-all and end-all. But if you now look at TikTok three years later and where that's taken it, you've got hashtags like teens taking trend, um, trend babies, girls on trend. Um, when I say trend, I mean Trembolone. Now, if you think about an 18-year-old boy on Trembolone, and that's going to shut down your testosterone production. And if you take it for long enough, it may shut down your testosterone production permanently. And there are kids who are willing to do that. And they're happy to be on TRT, testosterone replacement therapy for life. And they're doing this just to look big on TikTok. So we, we, we're in the middle of a societal shift where I think in public steroids are just openly discussed and I think in sport it's almost impossible to ignore that discussion it really is so if you go on go on Instagram now yeah and if you if you look at hashtag girls who power lift go look at the numbers those women are doing right now and that will tell you all you need to know about how many people are at this it is absolutely insane you've got Brits who have gone over to Dubai because you can buy the stuff over the counter and so they just make their living in Dubai, taking steroids, lifting weights, posting OnlyFans content. And it's a viable source of living. So it's almost hard to say, well, if society is so blasé about taking these compounds, how long is it till sport becomes blasé about taking these compounds? And maybe that's where we're headed, that these things become undetectable. And even if they are detectable, no one's going to care because we may be consuming them ourselves. So that brings me to kind of the, the wider reason Conor Ben was there. So John Ryder fights Canelo in, I think it's Guadalajara, which is strange. But so I'm torn on this. I'm happy for John Ryder because I think this fight is the fight that means John Ryder could retire in the next couple of years and not have to work again if he does everything properly. And, you know, you, we can say it, whatever we want to say about Tony Sims and his gym. As a man, Tony Sims will make sure that the people under his tutelage are well looked after. So one thing I will give Tony Sims credit for is he looks after his present fighters and his past fighters as well. So I know uh, Davy Stewart speaks highly of Tony Sims and many others do as well. But it's a fight that doesn't make sense to me. John Ryder has either lost or struggled against people that Canelo has dominated. So I can't see what he can do differently. He's, he's too short to keep Canelo off. He's too slow to out-punch out Canelo. And he's not strong enough to out-muscle Canelo. I, I, I genuinely see this being a pretty savage fight for John Ryder. Whether he gets stopped or not, I don't know. But I can see this being a pretty savage beating because that bivol loss would have affected Canelo. And he, he will want to make sure... He makes statements now going, going forward. He just wants to make a statement to make sure that Bivol is nervous. Because that rematch will come. Canelo won that rematch. But that rematch is more driven by commercial reality. If you're Eddie Hearn, you know Bivol versus Baturbiev doesn't make a lot of money. It's two Russians. And our socio-political climate at the moment is very anti-Russian. So people won't want to be seen to be putting money into the you know, Russians' hands. And you can promote Canelo versus Baturbiev better because that's almost your good versus bad, right? And then in parallel, you can run uh, Callum Smith versus Bivol. That's really how you'd want to do it if you were Eddie Hearn trying to maximize your profits. To do it any other way, I think you shoot yourself in the foot. But it's, it's a strange fight. I think this is a fight that no one's going to stay up for. It's a fight that no one really cares about because we understand that it's just been engineered that way. So... I don't know, what do you do if you're Canelo? Like, you're meant to be the face of boxing, but I think after this Canelo fight, we'll still be talking about Ryan Garcia versus Javante Tank Davis. That's when you know you're the face of boxing, when we can still talk about a fight that happened a couple of weeks ago. But look, good luck to both of them. I think it's going to be a convincing Canelo win. If John Ryder were to upset Canelo and win, wow. That would be... Would that be the biggest British win abroad? I think, I think that would outdo Hannigan versus Curry. 
so yeah, I think this has been DAZN's week. I think this is the week we've we've kind of seen them drown out because I didn't even realize Joshua Boatsy was fighting this weekend. So they've been they've been effective in drowning out Sky and Boxer so far. But I think we're getting to the business end of the week now. So we'll see if if Shalom and the team can can come out with something. But I think just looking at DAZN, Hearn's got his renewal for another three years in the United States and Mexico. Um, Something interesting came out of DAZN, actually, where the chief financial officer was saying the UK is not... Growth in the UK will not harm DAZN at all. And I think what he's realised is it's harder to grow in the UK than it is in other markets. And so their view is, you know, we're essentially chasing the people who have Sky. And I think that's like one in five of our population. Whereas you can try and grow in countries that are populous, like Ethiopia and Nigeria, with a combined population of like 350 million people, which is around the population of the EU, maybe slightly below, but that's two countries. You can start to look at growth in places like Indonesia. That, and I think that's where you're going to see the zone starting to grow. So as long as Hearn can build a product that is appealing to those markets, he can always justify his existence. He doesn't have to win Britain anymore. And that's why you'll see her look less and less towards Britain and more towards these other markets in terms of staging events, signing fighters. You'll see him become that global promoter because I think DAZN have realized it's too expensive to compete here. Unless you're going to merge with Sky or well, you know, there's an acquisition one way or the other, it's too expensive for what you get. And the, the jewel in the crown is no longer the United Kingdom. Which is ironic considering that they are based out of Hammersmith things, Hammersmith Grove they're based out of. So yeah, I find that really, really strange. But congratulations. Look, you know, we always dig Eddie Hearn out when he gets things wrong, but congratulations to him for for being able to secure that. Whether it's value for money, we don't know until we see the numbers. But one thing we can generally conclude is he hasn't spent a billion in his time at the zone. But one of the other things that I find interesting about this the zone strategy that I thought I'd add was Really what they're trying to do is become the, the app for everything, much like Elon Musk said Twitter should be. So the idea is this. I watch Real Madrid versus Napoli in the Champions League. Napoli do another one of their camo kits, which might be one of my favorite kits of the last 10 years. The, was it the 2013 shirt, the camo one? And you can watch it and go, man, that's a hell of a shirt. And you should have a facility there, if they do it properly, where you just buy the shirt. Watching the game, you buy the shirt, it gets delivered the next day. Now, from a boxing context, what are you selling? And, you know, Anthony Joshua's launched his, his clothing line. It feels a bit too little, too late, you know. I think the time to have done that was probably about three years ago. But at least he's, he's trying something. But most boxers don't have anything they can sell. So if I'm watching Boxer X against Boxer Y, and they're fighting for a world title. Maybe they're fighting to unify. What's going to pop up between rounds for me to buy? Nothing. In the build-up, what's there going to be? Can I, can I, buy, a, can I buy a Tyson Fury t-shirt via this app? I don't think boxers are set up for that. Can I buy an Amir Khan t-shirt? Can I buy nostalgic t-shirts? So if I wanted to, there's a documentary on Muhammad Ali on the zone. Can I buy some Muhammad Ali memorabilia? I think if you do that, and if boxers can figure out how to, to link what they do with e-commerce, then maybe DAZN's a platform to be on. Um, but we're a long way off that. You know, I, I'm thinking, I mean, that's like 2035 thinking right there. I know people want to know that. So where are we with Joshua versus Wilder? I genuinely think we've been here before so many times that... Do we need to talk about it? You know Wilder will take the money because he's on the downside of his career, much like Fury is as well, but I think Fury's probably got a year and a half more in this game than Wilder has. So you know Wilder will take the money because there's nothing left for him to prove. Once he's fought Joshua, Wilder's got the complete career for me. You can say that he never beat Tyson Fury, and if you think Tyson Fury's the greatest heavyweight of the modern era, then you can understand why he didn't, considering Wilder's the guy who took up boxing pretty much at the last minute. But he would have had a complete career. that He would have fought everyone he had to fight in his era. And he'd be the first one to do it. If he fought Joshua this year. And if he beat Joshua this year, to be able to have gone um, 
of the of of this peers, you'd have fought Joshua once, you'd have fought Fury three times. That's four, four fights. To go two losses, a draw, and a win, because I think he beats Joshua. That wouldn't that, that's that's Hall of Fame worthy for me. Like as a heavyweight, that's Hall of Fame worthy. He ticks the boxes. He jumped in with his peers. And he didn't wait for them to get old because he's the oldest. You know, the eldest, I should say. He's the eldest of the lot. So he hasn't waited for people to get old. So he would have fought the, the, his peers, as in Fury and Joshua. He'd have also fought the boogeyman in the division, who was Luis Ortiz. And not only that, but he would have knocked some of these guys out. So I think he knocks Joshua out. He's knocked Luis Ortiz out twice. He's iced Brazil. He's put Fury down numerous times. So I think... If you're going to put a heavyweight from this era in the Hall of Fame, well, there's a good shout for it. So he'll take the money now. Why wouldn't you? There's nothing left after this apart from to fight Fury for a fourth time. There's nothing left for him. Joshua needs to take it because he needs to rescue his reputation somehow. Because if this fight doesn't happen this year, I think Joshua's done and he'll probably just have to retire. Because I, if, if he can't fight Wilder, he definitely can't fight Fury. But I'm, I'm just holding off until this fight happens and it's announced and signed and I see a press conference. Because we've been here so many times where Hearns told us it's positive, it's this, it's that. I want to hear that these guys have accepted. I don't hear that, yeah, I want to fight Wilder. No, no, I want to hear contracts have been signed. And what I find interesting is we're now at the point where we're just talking about one fight now, Joshua Wilder. It seems that Fury and Usyk is out of the picture now, which is good. Because I don't think it does the same numbers that Joshua Wilder does. So if we get Joshua Wilder in December in the Middle East, well, Saudi Arabia, I should say, kudos. But I will, I'll, I'll keep my own counsel until then. But if it does happen, will I be out there? <laughs> You're damn right I will be. I, I will be there unashamedly. Whether I've got to get media credentials, however I've got to get there, I'm getting there. Can we just talk about Ryan Garcia for a second? Um... <laughs> for for a guy who is relatively clean cut, his boxing career is kind of messy. Like really messy. And maybe fans and coaches view these things differently. Like when I see a career that's got loads of distractions and you pull up in a lay by career wise and you slow down, and you do all of these things before the age of twenty five is a big big red flag to me. It tells me you won't fulfill your potential. Generally speaking, you expect a boxer to really knuckle down between the ages of 17 and 24. Don't get injured. Don't acquire bad habits. Don't miss training sessions. Don't ignore your craft. All these sorts of things become really important in those seven years because that's your platform for success. You know, Ryan Garcia was out the ring for 15 months with mental health issues. Understandable. Um, you know, he, he had a lot come to him very quickly. And he's been, he's been that kind of golden boy since he was a teenager. So he's had a lot of pressure to cope with, and I don't necessarily think he's the most resilient of characters. I think he's a guy who enjoys boxing from like a technical perspective. I don't know if he enjoys it from that kind of that dog perspective. But then you've got to balance that against the fact that he fought Luke Campbell. And at that kind of sub-world level, Luke Campbell's as good as they come. And he was able to get off the canvas against Luke Campbell and stop him. So he's got character. But has he got discipline? Has he got focus? And has he got hunger? Because in Tank Davis, he, f he fought someone who has. And in Devin Haney, he might have to fight someone else who has. And in Shakur Stevenson, he's going to fight someone who definitely has. But has Ryan got that? Has he got that, that humility to say, I will, I will give myself to a trainer and whatever he tells me to do, I will do. Because he couldn't do it with Reynoso. I remember Canelo saying, Ryan's too lazy. He doesn't know how to work hard. And when you, when you step away from a guy like Joe Goosen, and Joe Goosen is generally quite well respected in the sport. I'm not going to say there's something wrong with you, but we have to start asking questions about what's going on here. We won't know until Ryan picks another trainer, but who are you going to pick? Are you going to pick Manny Robles? Who are you going to pick? You're going to keep it to someone like a, maybe a Julian Chua? I have no idea. But what I can say for absolute certain is he needs stability for the next two years. He needs stability and he needs to commit to whatever his situation is. He needs to commit and he needs to do that in order to, to be the best that he can be. Because 
it's only going to get tougher for him now on that road to redemption. It's just going to get tough for him because the people he has to fight in that division are all killers. Even if you pick someone like a Frank Martin, Frank Martin's a killer. So what do you do if you're Ryan Garcia? I just, I don't like seeing fighters switch coaches because it's rarely ever the coach's fault. Like if you can't take ownership for the fact that you didn't get up. That wasn't Joe Goosen. You didn't get up. You left yourself exposed. No one taught you to do that. You left yourself exposed. You got caught. You didn't answer the count. Now, does that mean you quit? I don't know, because I don't know what was in your mind, but you didn't answer the count. Joe can't be blamed for that. You came in shape. You were boxing well, initially. So clearly, whatever you'd worked on was working. But it was a lack of discipline, a lack of focus. You said it yourself. You got bored in there. You have an opportunity to entertain the world. You have a chance to make millions of dollars. You have a chance to cement yourself as a sporting superstar in the United States, the most lucrative sports market there is. How the hell are you getting bored in a fight? I can never understand how elite level boxers get bored or lose concentration. Like, it's three minutes. Three minutes, 12 times max, you have to be good for. And that will define you know I mean? your career, your life, everything. And he couldn't do that. That tells me Joe Goosen is not the problem. Ryan Garcia is the problem. And maybe that's what happens when you're like, am I a boxer or am I a superstar? I think you could be both, but you've got to be a great boxer to be a boxing superstar. Maybe Ryan just wants to be a broader superstar. Maybe that's his lane now. I don't know. But fighters shouldn't change trainers. And people say to me, yeah, but you, you've said people at the Peacock is this, that, and the third. And yeah, but what, here's what I've said. I'll tell you what I've said about the Peacock. I've said, who have they really trained for world title fights consistently? And that gym's been going for, for, for decades. They haven't. That's what I said. But these are facts. They haven't. But my main message was, if you're a boxer at the Peacock, it is on you to get out of it what you need. A better informed and better educated boxer can get more out of his training team because they get paid out of your purse. So you have to work them. And that's true for every boxer. That's not just a Peacock thing. That's a Ben Davison thing. Anyone who, who, who is licensed to train, even Joe G. If, I, if I'm being trained by Joe Gallagher, I want to push Joe as hard as I can because I want him to push me as hard as he can. Iron sharpens iron. So when people say you're anti-Peacock, not really. Because I think, and I've watched it with Denzel. As Denzel's grown as a man and as he's grown as a boxer, as he's taken in more ideas and influences, the stuff that happens in the Peacock has evolved. That's what I've seen. I've seen an evolution in the Peacock, which is what I call, it's an uptick. Am I the cause of that? I have no idea. But I know the guys in the gym are definitely part of that evolution. So credit to them. And I want more of that. I want more boxers challenging their trainers to be better. Because better trainers make better boxers. Better boxers make a better product. It's as simple as that. So as I keep saying, I've never told a boxer to leave a gym. I always just say, are you happy? If they tell me no, so what are your options? And you talk through the options. But I'll never tell someone to leave. Because I understand how hard it is to train someone. And I also understand how... Things can go wrong through no fault of your own. Okay? I'm fully sympathetic to that. And sometimes I wish that got spoken about more than some of the more sensational stuff I may do in episodes. That never gets talked about, that my, my loyalty is always to the trainer because I know how hard it is to do that job. I know how insecure that job can be. Like People have no idea how banged up some of these trainers are. No idea. You know, that there are boxing trainers who can't lift their shoulder past 90 degrees. So they can only go as high as parallel to the floor because of the trauma of holding pads. You know, there are guys who, whose hips are screwed from years of holding that body shield. Trainers put their bodies on the line too. So I'll always have respect for what they do because it's so underappreciated. What, what normally gets talked about 
are the, the tactical geniuses, supposedly. Which, by the way, is all a media creation. This idea that coaches are tactical geniuses is nonsense. Because no one ever asked them, right, write down what you're going to do in the fight and how the fight's going to go. Then let's seal up the envelope. And at the end of the fight, let's read it out to you and see if that's how the fight went. Because if you're a tactical genius, then that's what you'll be. Or what we'll be able to hear is, oh, in round four, I made this change. We'll be able to hear it because they've got, they've got mics in the corner. The, the tactical genius thing is just coaches trying to justify why they're in their position. A lot of it's nonsense. Boxing's really, really simple. Get your guy fit. Get his basics to 10 out of 10. Get his mind right or her mind right. There you go. Done. Yeah. Really, really simple. But the thing is, it takes a special person to make the simple look amazing. But no. So my point is, Boxers shouldn't be looking to tra change trainers all the time. There'll be a point in your career where you can, and Miguel Cotto is a good example. You can switch trainers. like You can go from Pedro Diaz to a Freddie Roach, for example. Once you've matured, because your style is your style, and all you sometimes need is different, different sensory stimuli. That's all. You just need to see different things, hit a different bag, spar different people, do your run in the evening instead of the daytime. You just need your body to be shocked into adaptation. And maybe you need a new environment to do that. But I'm generally not a strong advocate of people just changing trainers. I, I, I rarely see an uptick in performance. Like at best, you will maintain what you have. But it's hard to grow with someone new because you spend so much time relearning how they do things that that's time you don't move forward. So I'm going to just bring the mood down a bit. And we've got to talk about David Light. So David Light fights Lawrence Ocoli. I think that was his mandatory for the WBO, right? A fight that no one really wanted to see, but I guess you had to go through it. But it was definitely not a fight I wanted to see. I don't think David Light stood a chance in hell of being Lawrence Ocoli. And so what proceeded was Lawrence essentially beating up David Light and David Light showing what a tough man he is, right? <laughs> That's what we got. So we don't get a knockout and Lawrence wins a unanimous decision. Um, there wasn't a question about Lawrence winning that fight. So, if you remember what people were saying at the time, just round by round, people were like, you should really think about pulling David Light out. That's it. Yeah, his corner should be thinking about pulling him out. I think but round number 10, you're like, pull him out. Right, that's it. Pull him out. That was where my head was. I think that's why I tweeted. I said, if you're his corner and you had any compassion, you just pull him out. He's not going to win this. And he's just taking punishment. But instead, the talk about the, after the fight was how tough David Light is, and he gets pats on the back for being tough. And that's okay. He manages to make it to the hotel fine, right? And I think he gets back home, and he doesn't feel well. So he's back in New Zealand, and he's like, right, I feel terrible. And the doctors say it's probably just delayed concussion. Go home. Rest. You'll be fine. It doesn't get any better. So he goes in, and they do um, a CT scan. Everything comes up clear. Mate, you're fine. It's just concussion. You know, don't make a big deal about it. Goes back again, and they do another CT scan, but this time they do one afterwards that they call a contrast CT scan. So they, they inject you intravenously with something they call dye. I don't know if it's iodine or something like that. And what that does is it allows... It allow, well, so that dye stops the radiation, so the dye comes up as white. So anything that's not white, you can look at it, you can work out if there are blood clots anywhere in the system you can figure that out by essentially running this dye and the contrast ct scan shows that there's a blood clot on the brain and now it turns out that david light suffered a mild stroke <laughs> now you can't say it's down to what happened in the ring with lawrence you can't even work out to what extent that contributed it wouldn't be fair on that situation and it wouldn't be fair around the people who organized the fight and executed the fight in good faith it wouldn't be fair but it just comes back to this question of if we know how this thing ends more often than not, what do we want as boxing fans? Because if David Light says, I've had enough, we call him a quitter. Even if he was doing it to preserve his health, even if he was doing it because he could see white dots and he got scared. Not scared of the fight, but scared of the ramifications of the fight. And that's not an unreasonable thing to do. 
what do we want? Because you know, in David Light's corner, they're like, we could pull him out. But you know that if you pull him out, he may get crucified on social media. And it's not just him on social media. It may be his family, his friends, people who are close to him that also have to have a hard time. So now you're weighing this up because as fans, a lot of us put so much weight into that warrior mentality that we can't see the humanity behind that. And so for me, that humanity is, what do you, what do you want? When, when, when can we say enough is enough for a fighter? When, when are we going to preserve these guys for another day? Or is, is you know, head trauma what we really want? Is head trauma what we aspire to? I don't know if there's a right answer to this because for every David Light, there are examples of guys who have taken batterings and are relatively okay. But we should, have a, we should have a climate where it's okay to, you know, to be pulled out of a fight. It's okay to, to pull yourself out of a fight. Or it's okay to say to a ref, something's not right. And then you say to the doctor, look, I'm seeing white spots or I'm seeing red spots. Is that, a, is that good? But then people say you're soft because there's a minority of fans who want to be toxic. Regardless of who wins or who loses, they want to stick it to the loser. They want to humiliate the loser. And these will be people who themselves have no aspirations to engage in combat. Don't have the character, don't have the discipline, don't have the will. But they just want to be toxic. And that's got people scared to do what's best for their health. And I feel for David Light because I'm not sure that he's earned enough money in his career that he doesn't have to work again. But what do you do after you suffer a mild stroke? Because you're going to have to declare that in whatever role you choose to do. And yes, 100%, I wish him the best. And I also have some sympathy for Lawrence. Because if you're Lawrence, that's not what you wanted to do to someone. And so Lawrence will be there going, I, I, I may have been involved in this. And David Light has a family. He has this, he has that. And, you know, boxing's that kind of community where you f where you feel each other's pain so i can i can get where that would come from but i wish david light all the best i hope this will trigger a a sensible conversation amongst boxing fans about how we react to certain things it's okay to pull someone out of a fight after three rounds if they're completely in over their head they don't need to be ironed out they don't need to take a shellacking they don't need to do all that stuff to prove how tough they are i promise to god if someone's fighting for a world title they already proved their toughness year after year for numerous years prior to that moment. I, and I was going to try and elevate the mood, but now it looks like Manny Pacquiao may be in the ring again. So, so Manny Pacquiao, if you remember when Pacquiao was meant to fight Errol Spence, like he was offered the deal. I think it was a pretty good deal, actually. And So Pacquiao was like, yeah, I'll fight Errol Spence. And what ended up happening was Errol had to postpone the fight because pre-fight medical showed he had a, I think he had a detached retina. So then, so that fight doesn't happen. And over time, um, Spence ended up fighting Ugas. And we all know that Ugas beat Manny Pacquiao and then got elevated to super champion, yada, yada, yada. But essentially, there was a company called Paradigm Sports who had, a, I think they had like a four-fight deal with Manny. And they said, well, Manny broke the contract to take the Spence fight. And even though he didn't fight that Spence fight, they still sued him. And so they won. And essentially, after Manny's paid um, damages, costs and all that, it looks like he's $8 million in the hole to these Paradigm guys. And you hear about how generous Manny is and how he's probably given away most of his winnings. So you wonder, does he have enough money to pay this? And if he doesn't, are we going to see him in the ring? More importantly, are we going to see him in that exhibition with Floyd? I have a feeling we might do. Now, do I want to see two middle-aged men who have seen better days jump in an exhibition? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, boxing's that bad at the moment. I would happily sit there and watch Floyd and Manny go at it. I don't know how good either of them are going to be against each other, but I would happily do that just for the nostalgia value. Do that, get Mike Tyson on the undercard against someone like, I don't know, pick whoever you want, Ray Mercer, whoever. But it's, it's sad to see that you know, boxers are still being badly advised. It's sad to see that boxers are still, 
even in retirement, having to shell out money. Because if you remember, Manny went to run for president of the Philippines, and that didn't end too well for him. I think he got like 7% of the vote. Bearing in mind, he must be the nation's biggest sports star. So, yeah, I, I think that, you know, Manny's not that much older than me. So I imagine that's a pretty big existential crisis. Like, who the hell am I really? If, if, I, can't, if I can't win the love of my people like this, then was that love ever real in the first place? So, yeah, I feel for Manny. I don't want to see him in a pro boxing ring, but if he can do the exhibition with Floyd and they can get the right money behind it, I'm 100% on board with that if it helps them kind of secure his financial future. And I can't believe I'm saying this about Manny Pacquiao. I just wanted to touch on quickly the, um, the state of the amateur situation at the moment because it's a bit of a mess. Um, at the top level, it's an absolute mess. So, if, as everyone knows, boxing is not rostered for the 2028 Olympics uh, in the States. So after 2024, next year, boxing won't be, a, won't be an Olympic sport. At the, at the root of it is essentially corruption at the global governing body. Right? So they've gone in, they've looked and they've realized there's a, there's a load of corruption. Um, bribes were offered, alleg allegedly bribes were offered for medals. And they, they only looked at 2016, but you can imagine the same was true for 2012, that palms were greased. Um, and that may explain some of the results that we still dispute to this day. So P, I think it was PwC went in, did an audit of it, gave some recommendations. A lot of those are being implemented by the IBA, which was previously IEBA. Right? But the IBA is essentially run by the, the Russians, the Kazakhs, and the Azeris, um, with support from their allies like the Cubans and so on and so forth. And so... There are essentially two camps, right? And it's a power struggle. There's the Eastern camp and the Western camp. So the Western camp is the United States, United Kingdom, Ireland, France, potentially Germany, right? That's, that's the camp. And their, their whole argument is we're really who the people come to see. Now, that's their argument. We have people come to see us. Um, ignoring the fact that their total combined population is about half a billion. And if you add up the rest of them, that's the rest of the world. So they, they ignore that. But they have a powerful ally in that most of the organizations behind the Olympic movement, your McDonald's, your Burger Kings, your Nikes, your Coca-Colas, your Pepsis, are all kind of Western companies. So they've got that advantage on their side. Now, they want to break away, and they want to control amateur boxing, and so they want to form their own governing body, which will then hopefully be accredited for the Olympics. But the official governing body is still the IBA. And the IBA, is, I think the, the president of the IBA is Russian. A lot of the backers are either Russian, Ukrainian, whatever. It, it's mainly run from the East. Like They don't generate a lot of money outside of the East. And so this is the problem. But as part, part of this power struggle, what they're now trying to do, the IBA are now going to introduce prize money for the World Championships, which I don't think is a bad thing. Um, the aim is to have a million dollar prize fund for gold medal winners by 2027. So I don't know how many weight classes. Let's just say they have 20 weight classes. So that's, you win a gold medal, that's 50 grand. Now how that's split between coach and governing body, I have no, uh, between coach, fighter and governing body, no idea. But 50 grand would be good money to win a tournament. To, to be world champion, that's, that's a lot of kudos and a lot of good money there. And so that may make it the preeminent amateur tournament if it's no longer an Olympic sport. And that's another way to keep people sweet. So you can dangle that carrot in front of people from Asia, Africa, the Eastern European region and the Middle East and isolate the West in that sense. Because the Brazilians would generally side with um, the IBA. So it's an absolute mess at the moment. And you can't see boxing being an Olympic sport so they sort out this corruption. But the weird thing is, uh, the IBA seem to be very rich. They seem to just sit on a war chest of about 10 to $15 million, which they don't spend on anything. So I don't know how that's going to play out. But it's, it just means you won't see the box. You, you're unlikely to see boxing at the Olympics for a long time, in my opinion, because we, this mess can't be sorted out. And it goes to show that everyone loves corruption in boxing, whatever the level, pro or amateur. And it, it, it casts a cloud at a time when British amateur boxing is rebuilding and it's coming back again. So 
I think we had some some dark times between 2016 and probably 2022 because GB hung on to a lot of people they shouldn't have hung on to. But now it looks like, you know, we're getting the fresh blood in. Um, um, the, the kids who won the National Amateur Championships used to be called the ABAs. Very impressive, although I was surprised Isaac Oko didn't win, considering the, the pedigree and, you know, the, the years in the game. I thought Isaac Oko was super talented, so surprised he didn't win. Um, but I was happy for a kid called Gideon Antwi. So Gideon Antwi is the super heavyweight champion in the ABAs. And I remember watching him in about October 2015, and he was a novice. He was in the novice championships, 91 kilograms, wild, just swung. And he, he just swung till he got tired, but normally he'd get you out of there before he got tired. And to watch him evolve, and you got to remember, he's been an amateur when he, he was in the pecking order. He was behind guys like Courtney Galed, Jamie Shakiva, Courtney Bennett, uh, Big Aussie. Uh, if you look broader than that, guys like Steve Robinson, Nick Campbell, all these guys Gideon's been behind. But he's always stuck at it. And now he finally gets his reward. He's been part of the GB setup for a while now. And he's just, I'm just happy for the guy. Just to see someone stick at the sport for so long and stay consistent and dedicated. And his style hasn't changed much. He's just been able to adapt it to what the judges need to see. So him being champion, ah, absolutely delightful. Happy for him. Because uh, I remember... Like, who did they have last year? They had like they had the doctor guy, and he's a lovely man, but he was like thirty nine or something. Then that's not something you can build, you know, get excited about because you know he he's a doctor. He already has money, so he'll be an amateur for life. But it was good to have Gideon win that. And I think that's a really good news story. So congratulations to him. Um, London boxing looks like it's thriving again in this rebuilding phase. I was at I was at the All Stars show last Friday. Because we had a young guy boxing there, Krish, who is coming on leaps and bounds, actually. Uh, I, like, I like the change in mindset I've seen in him since we started working together, where he, he takes it seriously now. You don't just show up for the jolly. Like, you're showing up to excel now. And you know, we need to just feed through that mindset change. You know, these things aren't easy. People think it's just about tactics. It's not it's really about mindset. If you can get someone determined to perfect their craft, man, you're halfway there. Um, was amazing. I think that's probably the first time I've sat in a changing room for an extended period of time in ages. So it was lovely to see a good friend of mine, Simon Rose. Um, coach I really fucking respect, really do. Um, I always say, and I've done this since I've known Sai, I always watch how Sai warms up fighters. He's the best guy at warming a kid up in terms of like the physical part and the mental part. Just little nuances, like he might spot that his fighter's opponent is watching and then he knows how to switch it up just to send a message and then bring it back down. He's, he's a yeah, hell of a trainer. Got a lot of time and respect for him, man. You know, the, the Fitzroy Brotherhood runs deep. So it was lovely to see him. Good to see Coach Steve at Stonebridge. Um, always good good energy, good vibes, you know. And all the other guys who were there as well. White Hart Lane did their thing. Um, Paul Strutt at All Stars, lovely to see him now that he's working with Freezy. He's got that, that, that high profile now. People know who he is. So now I'm happy, man. It's, it's nice, to, nice to be around friends. And you call them colleagues because we kind of do the same thing. But it's nice to be around friends and good people. And, and it's also nice to see that there are a couple of kids who are coming through. They're still doing three two-minute rounds, so we don't know how they're going to transition to the three threes. But it's nice to see that there's a a growing talent pool and like these are guys who are who are all trying to go for the stoppage you're seeing very little of that tippy tap stuff which i thought was killing amateur boxing anyway yeah definitely a, a few a few more kids that can bang so that's always good to hear so yeah just you know quick update you know it's bubbling along nicely so i think in about six years there's gonna be some really talented kids coming through into the pro scene if they if they manage everything properly just realized I've talked for absolutely ages. I've done this with no headphones again. God. Um, always appreciate the love, like I said. Always happy to celebrate that fourth anniversary of the Larry episode. It it did so much for me, and hopefully it did a lot for you guys too. And, you know, that's what we try to do. There's a reason we call this Beyond Boxing. We, we, we try to move things forward 
You know, instead of just talking about the gossip that he says, she says, just getting things to what are the real issues and how do we move those forward? So, no, the support and the love is always appreciated, guys. Thank you very much and take care. Porky's Corner is proud to be sponsored by Spartan Site Solutions. They are specialists in civil engineering and demolition contracts for the construction industry. Interested parties should visit their website or contact Porky's Corner for a referral at porkycorner@mail.com.